Thank you, Brenda. Good morning. Today we're continuing our series, Remain, from two weeks ago. We were reading together in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8 in the New International Version. I'm going to read portions of that text now. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Verse 4. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Father, thank you. Amen. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Mutual indwelling. John chapter 15, this is the moment where Jesus and his followers, disciples, are together in a place called the Mount of Olives. They're in a garden known as Gethsemane. Leading up to this moment, he is speaking to them about his death, which is imminent. He is sharing a meal with them an annual celebration, a festival among the Jews that's celebrated to this very day called the Passover. During that meal, he serves them, leaving them an example that they don't understand in the moment by washing their feet, an act that would be done not by, by the leader or the teacher. It, it, in fact, it wouldn't even be done by his followers. There would be a designated individual who was considered a slave or a servant who would wash the feet of people entering a home. Now, no one washes, you wash your own feet, I, I get it. But when you walk into certain people's homes, oftentimes they want you to remove your shoes and leave them at the door so you don't track through the house what you've accumulated. Well, imagine if it's not asphalt, if it's just a dirt road, and everybody wears sandals. So you walk 20 miles, and that's considered a day's journey, uh, and you go visit someone, you've collected a lot of dirt on your feet. So when you walk in, the first thing you do is you have a seat, and there's a servant who's assigned to wash your feet in a basin. In fact, when he goes to wash the feet of one of his closest followers, Simon, he goes, are you going to wash my feet? We can be so familiar with that text or that passage that we don't understand. He's saying, wait, 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 what? That's, that's not you. You don't, you don't wash anybody's feet. And we don't even wash your feet. That person over in the corner, that's the one who does it. He's saying, you don't understand what I'm doing. But I'm leaving an example to you about how my kingdom works. It's not like the world in which you live. The world in which you live, it's a top-down thing. The world of my kingdom those who have the greatest authority serve everybody. I can hear your mind. That's not Monday morning, 9 a.m. where I work, Pastor. But he's laying something out. After that meal, they go to the Mount of Olives, and they're in the place where they have been oftentimes. And he is using... An illustration that is so familiar to them that he hopes they can't miss it. I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. I'm the vine, and my father is the gardener. There's a relationship between the vine and the vine dresser, a relationship between the vine and the gardener. Anybody here or online into gardening? Yeah. It's like we get our milk from Safeway. Nobody's milking cows around here. It, it, kids grow up today and they think milk comes from the grocery store. Some of us are so removed because we didn't grow up in an agricultural environment. So some of what we read doesn't always translate as well, unless we've seen it on National Geographic, but we still don't have the experience of it. It's all virtual, so to speak. But they would have been really, really... Uh, immersed in a culture where everybody drank wine and the whole thing of wine and the vine and branches would have been so common. 
So we have to use illustrations from our old culture to make it connect. That's why we, we have to talk about IT things and, you know, the default on your screen, yes or no, because that's where we live. But they would have understood what he was saying. And he is using an earthly illustration to talk about the relationship that exists between himself and his father, between the son of God and father in heaven. And he's explaining that relationship. And then he goes on and talks about the vine and the branches. So now he's talking about my relationship with you and your relationship with me. So he's using all this imagery, and they can probably see vines and branches while he's talking to them because he would use what was right before them to make sense of it. Did you ever do that? No? Yes? Um, I'll just tell this story here. I was on a basketball court. Anybody ever play basketball? See, lots of hands go up. Talk about vine and branches, kind of like, say what? Talk about basketball. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to play right now. Um, I was playing basketball, five on five, turkey thicket. It's not far from here. A little outdoor pickup. This is, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, this guy playing on the court had a cross around his neck. It was beautiful. I hadn't seen it. It wasn't gold, it wasn't silver. It was made out of some other material. And uh, I asked him about it. He said, yeah, I made this while I was in prison. I said, wow, that's cool. I said, tell me about it, you know. He had not um, heard of Jesus. So there was no association between the cross around his neck and what it represented. The, the cross is common day, it's capital punishment, it's, it's the electric chair, um, it's lethal injection, the chamber, right? And it happens all around our country. But he was in prison and didn't realize he was wearing a symbol of what happens when you're on death row. I, and it was the, the, the disconnect in his mind for me in that moment that he had not heard of Jesus it was the first time in my life that I've met someone who never heard of Jesus. And uh, so we talked about that cross and what it meant. He's like, man, I had no idea. And I remember uh, asking him a question. I said, what if you were on death row? I was speaking his language at that point because he had spent quite a bit of time in prison. And this was after the game. We were just sweating, sitting on the side. You know, preaching the gospel doesn't have to be you open the Bible. It's just you doing relationship with somebody close by. And a subject comes up and you find an entry point. That's how I think about it. Um, I, I don't think it has to be like my small group life changers, you know, where we might be opening the Bible and going to text. I didn't sit down with them and say, open up to Romans chapter 10. And if you didn't know what the cross was, Romans chapter 10 wasn't going to make any sense. And a lot of times we don't realize that our language, it's, uh, it's, it, it's jargon it, it, that people, it doesn't translate. It's like going to the doctor and they start using medical terminology and you're like, doc, just tell me what's wrong. <laughs> speak English, right? So if you're a follower of Jesus, speak, the, the, speak what's common. Speak what's understandable. And it may take work to get there, particularly if you grew up church your whole life. You've got all the buzzwords and all the phrases, and they just come out all the time. You ever meet somebody like, yeah, they definitely in church, right? Because it's just, it just flows out of them. And so while we were having this conversation, I was loving that moment. Because he was just leaning in, death row. And because I was a criminal justice major, I knew something about death row and the dehumanization of the individual and the last 48 hours and your last meal and how, um, you know, there's a shaving of the head. And it, the whole idea in the, in the book that I was reading in college was like, you're dead before you even get to the chair. There's a whole dehumanization that happens. And, and the separation of those who put you in the chair, that it's just a job because one person is responsible for strapping in one arm, another person straps in another arm, another person straps in a leg, another person straps in another leg, another person puts the helmet on, and another person put, put, so no one is responsible for your death. Everybody only played a part. So that's how you can go home and have dinner with your family and be fine. You didn't kill anybody. You're just doing your job. It's this whole psychology. So I had to read a lot of books about this stuff. But that guy dies right in front of everybody. Some die unjustly. 
God's got them, though. So I'm unpacking all this stuff as we're talking about death row. I said, imagine if you're on death row. And you're, you're in a chair. And they're about to throw the switch. So all you can do is hear. You know, this is the end. These are the last sounds, the last smell, the last everything. And you hear someone say, wait. Let me go in his place. He's like, what? Why would somebody do that? Like, oh, this story's going to be really good. Wait till we get to the end. He has no idea where we're going. What if there's an innocent person who offers to go in your place and they actually accept his life in exchange for yours? They take the hood off and there you are looking at him and he's staring at you, glazing. Gazing into your soul and they take you out and then they have you stand to the side and he gets in and he never takes his eyes off you to the last minute when they put the hood over your head. What are you thinking? She's like, I'm just like, why would this dude do this? He said it just like this. Why would dude do that? And I'm like, they throw the switch and he starts frying. And then they tell you you can go. I said, what's your next move? He said, I guess I'll go back to my cell. I said, no, 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 no. You don't have to go back to your cell. He actually paid for your crime. You can go free. It's like, oh, I guess I would leave the prison. So we painted the picture of the prison door opening him, stepping out into the sunlight that he hadn't seen, and you're free to go. And imagine you come to this court to play basketball, and while you're playing basketball, the dude who they killed three days ago walks up on the court. He's like, dang! That's how he said it. I would want to know that dude. I said, he actually wants to know you. We were in too deep at that point. And I explained who Jesus was and what he did for him on the cross. He never looked at that cross the same way. And, 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 and I just rejoiced. I got to pray with him. He just was pouring out his heart to Jesus as we sat in turkey thicket on the sideline, understanding what this cross was all about. I love that Jesus takes what's so familiar to us to give us an understanding of something that's deeper than what we can see with our eyes. That's what he's doing in this moment when he's talking about the vine and the branches. He says, my father is the gardener, I'm the vine. You're the branches, I'm the vine. He's laying it all out. And he says to them, re Remain in me as I remain in you. Now, how many of you hear that and you kind of go, yeah, okay, I get it. I mean, raise your, I mean, just online chat, yeah, I get it. Remain in me as I remain in you. You know, but we, you know how you can read something that becomes so familiar, you just kind of take it for granted, but there's more to it than what you just read? There's more to it. They're familiar with the vine and branches, but that is just an, earthly illustration about something that speaks as a part of his creation about how he himself has always related with the father in the godhead of the father the son and the holy spirit and now he's inviting them into what some call this divine dance we were singing this morning, we come alive in the river, we're dancing in the streets, right? Some of you, I thought when we were singing, we come alive in the river, like some are like, I don't even swim, I'm not going to be in a river. It just, but it's not about a literal river, it's about the river of his presence that we're being invited into to live in, to remain in, to stay in, to continue in. And when you get what he's really talking about, you understand there's something that happens dynamically in this relationship between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that Jesus paying the price for us to be reconciled to him, meaning being made one with him, that we get to experience continuously, and that allows you to have oxygen from heaven while you're on earth. When the astronauts go to the moon, they can't breathe in that atmosphere, so they have to take oxygen with them, and that allows them to walk around. 
And they make that... Thirteen forty-two, Roger. Jim, I'm One small step. Some of you are thinking about Darth Vader right now. Now that sound is funny, but that sound is their life. Because if you take away their oxygen supply, they are dead on the moon. Jesus was trying to explain, my life in you allows you to breathe on earth. And whoever doesn't have it is walking around dead already. Dead in their marriage. Dead in their family. Dead on their job. Dead in every situation they find themselves. Paul was so full of this that he was in prison going... We ain't even got to leave the prison, even though the gates broke open. You, you, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Let's make it real. Everything that was going down in 2020, what kind of air did you have to breathe in order to live through all of 2020 and now 2021? How many of you found it hard to breathe? George Floyd, I can't breathe. He's not the only one who can't breathe. And his reason different from most, but the reality for us as Christians, there is an air that we've been given to breathe that doesn't come from earth. He's trying to break it down. It's like a vine and a branch. The vine is in the branch. The branch is in the vine. I'm not saying where one starts and the other one ends. But if they're separated, there's no life. And scholars have taken time to explain what he's saying here. This relationship is called mutual indwelling. Just say it out loud. Mutual indwelling. One more time. Mutual indwelling. Here's, here's what he was saying. Look at John 14. I want to read verses 8 through 11. Because this is the backdrop to what he is saying in John 15. In John 15, when he's talking about, my father is the, the vine dresser and I'm the vine, that's an earthly picture. He's used, okay, you, you, you don't get me. For three and a half years, they would say, what did you mean by that story you told? Okay, let me explain it to you. What did you mean by that story you told? Let me explain it to you. We call it parables. He's always having to explain to us what he means because he's speaking about ideas, concepts, which for him are part of his unseen reality that are so unfamiliar to us here on earth that he's like, I'm trying to get you to think beyond, think outside the bowl, think outside the box. There's a way for you to live on earth that comes from the kingdom of God, but nobody understands on earth what I'm talking about. But it looks like things in my creation. So pay attention to this. Pay attention to this, because this is how my kingdom operates. And if you don't pay attention to my kingdom or know me, you'll just live like the rest of the world and miss what I am bringing you into and I want you to help bring the world into by living an example, not just talking the example. You with me? So... The vine and the branches didn't start with the vine and the branches. You back up a chapter and look what he's saying. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? This is a head scratch for Philip. This is a head scratch for the disciples. Why is Jesus saying, show us the, you know, what do you mean? Now watch what he says, verse 10. Don't miss this. Don't you believe that I am in the Father? The vine and the vine dresser. Don't you believe that I am in the Father? I'm actually in the Father. And that the Father is in me. That might be the most important takeaway today. 
Do we believe that Jesus is actually in the Father and that the Father is in Him? And do we believe that that is true for the duration of the time that He was physically in a human body on earth? That He was walking around saying, Do you believe that God in heaven is actually in me and that I'm in Him simultaneously at this present moment? This is really important. He said, the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. In other words, when I'm speaking, I'm not speaking from myself. He goes on and says this, the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. What he's saying, all the miracles I'm doing, that attest to the reality that I am the Christ, the Messiah, these miracles, the work of God, it's not me doing it by my own power or my own initiative or my own authority or me pulling myself up on my bootstraps. It is the Father living in me actively, doing His work through me because I am in Him and He's in me. And the degree to which He's in me, He's expressing His work, His purpose, and His power through me. I am seated in Him, resting in Him. You get the picture. Theologians go on and break this down. There's some Latin words that I don't even want to take time to unpack and get into this. But, but there are words that speak about what this literally means. And so when he says, I'm in him, literally the word in Latin means seated in another. Christ is actually seated in the Father, and the Father is actually seated in the Son. The Father is seated in the Spirit. The Spirit seated in the Father and in the Son. They're, they're seated in one another. This is a passive there's a passive meaning of this word in Latin. Then there's an act, it means a state of being. Thomas Aquila talked about this, a state of being. Um, now, and it's a completed act that conveys passive sense. There's also another word that is similar to that Latin word that means a state of doing. It means moving in and through the other refers to the entry of each divine person, meaning the Father, Son, and the Spirit, into the life of the other in total openness and freedom, which theologians of the Middle Ages used to image what's called the divine dance. So they are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit actively or passively seated in one another, and then they're also passing through, and I don't even know what this means. It's language for which I have no experience. But there's this passing through one another into one another, which is more active. And that is what theologians call this divine dance that is continuous. So there is no moment in eternity or in time where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are ever separated. At the beginning of creation, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all present. Seated in one another and moving through one another. When Mary conceives, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all present in that moment. Sometimes we pray and we're praying to Jesus. Sometimes we pray we're praying to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we're praying and praying to the Father. They're never separate. But they're never, their, their divine personalities are never commingled or coalesced. They maintain their personality and their identity while also never being separated. So they're not lost in one another. Jesus enters into the Father with total openness and freedom. There's nothing unknown to the Father about Jesus and vice versa. You know, when you're dating somebody, you don't let them in all the way. You let them come so far and you show your best, you're looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know when you go on a date. You know when you go on Bumble. You know when you go on, you, <laughs> come on, help me all these sites, and you're swiping left, and you're swiping right, and you put some information about yourself. You don't put everything about yourself online. You put the best things about you, not the bad things about you. <laughs> you guys sitting there like, online? What is that, Pastor? What, is, <laughs> what does it mean to go online? I've never met anyone online. How would you meet someone online? I met someone in line, but I've never met someone online. 
Y'all are funny. But Jesus, Father, and the Holy Spirit live in total openness and freedom with one another. And they also celebrate the, the, um, their self-acceptance, gracious self-acceptance of themselves in seeing and appreciating what is in the other. So there's no jealousy or envy or anything. We see someone else and they have something we don't and we envy. In the Godhead, they celebrate it. They're trying to get us to live like them. So Jesus had to die in order to invite us into the circle, the dance. Not just to be with him. Jesus in John chapter 14 is saying, let your hearts not be troubled. I'm giving you peace. My peace is not as the world gives peace. He says, I'm going. And Peter like, where are you going? I want to go. I've been with you three years plus. I don't want you to leave me. He's like, it's actually better that I go because I'm going to send another helper. He'll be with you and in you. You've gotten so used to me being with you here, but there's a, a proximity that's closer than this. It's me being in you. I remember when I used to think, man, I wish I could have lived during the time of Peter and them and seen it with my own eyes because it would help my faith. Well, people saw him with their own eyes and saw miracles and still didn't believe. It's him in you that's greater than him being beside you. Mm. Okay, we, we got to land this thing pretty soon. You got all that? He's saying, I'm going. Holland, give me just one moment. I'm going. But you need to understand something about the dynamic of relationship as I have originated. I'm in my Father and my Father's in me. And I'm about to go, but you need to remain in me even when I'm not here. And I'm actually going to remain in you so that the work you do will be greater than what you've done so far. Because what you're doing right now, you're doing alongside me, beside me. But what you're going to do will be the result of my spirit actually being in you. And the production of the fruit in your life will be produced by my presence and power in you, not just your effort. So Jesus says something to them. He says, by yourself you can do nothing. He wasn't just belittling them or saying, y'all can't handle it. He was saying, this is how I myself live. In John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus himself says, this is what Jesus says, by myself I can do nothing. The humility of a member of the Godhead to say, by myself I can do nothing. I do nothing apart from my Father and the Spirit dwelling in me. The first record of miracle we have on the Bible is after the Holy Spirit comes in him. We think Jesus is doing what he's doing because he's Jesus. Yes, but he's not doing it apart from the Spirit of God. And he's saying, if the same Spirit that raised me is dwelling in you, everything I've done, you'll do. So what do we have to do to do that? How do we work hard? you got to work hard at believing. And that's where the devil comes to attack you the most, to get you not to believe in me. Believe who I am and believe what I do. Um, so he says, by yourself you can do nothing. This is what um, one Indian theologian talked about. He used this example, and this is hopefully maybe easier than the, the branch and the vine. He said, a blacksmith will take iron, and they'll put iron in the fire. And when the iron is in this red, hot coal, it heats up. And as it gets hot, something happens. The iron that's in the fire gets so hot that the fire actually gets inside the iron. And the iron starts to burn this blazing red. And you can see now that the fire is in the iron. While the iron is in the fire, there's mutual indwelling. When the iron stays in the fire, fire. Someone please understand what I'm saying to you today. Go watch a movie, YouTube it. You see the iron gets so hot that it turns this brilliant red and it's glowing. It does not cease to be iron. 
It maintains its personality. It maintains its identity. But something has happened to it. Fire has entered the iron. And now the iron actually becomes bendable in the fire. So the fire's in the iron, and the iron is in the fire, and this is happening, and that's called mutual indwelling. Jesus wants us to understand, when you're in me and I'm in you, you become bendable, and my fire in you begins to express itself and does things that you can't do apart from me. So then here's what starts to happen. Once you come ablaze in the fire, and the fire is burning on the inside of you, Jesus says, ask whatever you want. Because you're inside me. So you'll make no request outside of me. And everything you say and do is going to happen because it's me doing the work. Paul said it this way. By the grace of God, I am what I am. The grace of God did not prove to no effect. He said, I worked harder than everybody else, but not me. It's the fire burning in me. Some of you think I'll never get ahead if I don't work hard enough. You need to work hard, but it's not hard work that produces what is called fruit. You may be productive without being fruitful. It's only when the fire starts to burn in you. That's why Jesus said, "Mm." he said this, in the world you will have, say it, anybody had any trouble? He says, but be of good cheer, take heart, Be be full of courage. Because I've overcome the world, and I give you my. So you knew trouble. We're more familiar with trouble than we are with peace, because we have to think, what, what did he give us? <laughs> peace. I know I got trouble. What do I have? Peace. Say it. In the world you'll have, but in me you'll have. And the peace I give you is not like the world gives. So we can actually live in the world full of trouble experience the trouble, our emotions begin to react to the trouble, the trouble of injustice, the trouble of poverty, the trouble of financial despair, the the trouble of a loved one die. All this is trouble. But in your trouble, he doesn't take you out of it. In your trouble, you can actually have, so you can have this dual thing because you're dwelling in him and he's dwelling in you. He's trying to tell you, I'm carrying the cross. It's weighty. It's painful. It's hurt. Yet at the same time, I'm so full of the joy right now internally that's allowing me to please my daddy without the pain being removed. Christian, stop wanting him to take your trouble away. Start dwelling in him and him dwelling in you where you start experiencing peace while you're in the trouble. Paul had peace while he was in prison. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been worshiping at midnight. Some of you, you worship on Sunday, but if you were in prison, you'd be like, get me out of here. Let's sing a hymn. Ain't nobody got time for singing. Get my lawyer. It's like this internal security system of him dwelling inside you that begins to move through your central nervous system and though fear is present, it's over, there's an override of fear because of the peace that's dwelling from your head to your toe, just vibrating, going up and down your body, going like, there's no reason why I should not be afraid. David going into battle against Goliath, not even afraid. Dude, he's 10 feet. I, 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 there's something on the inside of me that's greater than everything outside me. This is how we're called to live. This is how we're called to live. Lord, why did this happen to me? Why is this going on in my family? Yes, get understanding, insight as much as you can. Adjust all those things. But it won't fix or ever be a substitute from the indwelling presence of God. Let that fire begin to burn in you. That's what worship is about. It's sitting still until I can be heated up. Prayer is not just about saying, I talked to God today. It's that iron getting in the fire and remaining so that the fire gets in the iron. And then it's a wrap. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. You want to do something great from God? The problem is we try to do things in our own strength. 
Moses at 40 said, it's wrong for my people to be enslaved. So he killed an Egyptian for beating up a Hebrew. And God goes, I can use him, but right now, he ain't got no fire. He got a vision, and he's just running with the vision. He's not tied to a local church. He's going to do it by himself. He's mad at his pastor. He's just going to go out and change the world by himself. And he kills a man, and slavery continues. God's looking like, he don't have my power in him. I'll wait 40 years. I'll wear him down. I'll let him get to the point where he realizes I can't do anything by myself. How many of you got to the point where like, I can't? I can't. I just can't. I can't with you. I can't with this job. I can't help this. I can't do as much as I want. God's like, keep on, come on with the more can'ts. I can't, I can't, keep coming, I can't. Let me tell you, by yourself, you can't do anything. Start by dwelling in me like I dwell in my father because everything I did on earth, I didn't do any of it by myself. Why would we not learn from Jesus who said, by myself, I can do nothing? And we get up, I'm going to do it today. Uh, Go for it, champ. Let me know how that works out for you. We come alive in the river. We come alive in the fire. We come alive as we remain in you and you remain in us. God, right now for everybody online, everybody in this room, I pray we would know the pleasure of remaining in you and you remaining in us. There's so much I've tried to do in my life and I'm at some point you begin to see, oh, that was Donnell's effort. And people even say, man, that was so good, that was so good. And God goes, yeah, you should see what I could do. <laughs> I don't, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. I, I just think we all would agree we live in a culture that promotes do it by yourself. That's Western mind thought. If you were born in America or you've lived here for any length of time, it's, I got to make it happen. If it's going to be, it's up to me. Every commercial, every movie, there's one guy at the end with one gun, Rambo. Pick your movie. It's one guy. It's Neo in the Matrix. I I need to update my movies. It's it's Samuel Jackson and Ryan Reynolds in, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the movie. The, the, the bodyguard's hitman. It's always one dude with a gun. Jesus came and said, I'm putting down all my guns. I'm going to just take a knee and I'm going to wait till my Father fills me. And that's why I pray every day. Lord, I pray that we would put down our own weapons and pick up yours. That we would remain in you and you would remain in us. Please, I pray that people would today allow there to be an openness in themselves toward you, total openness and freedom. Lord, dwell in me, remain in me. Somebody might be watching online right now this is a moment for you to just surrender and say, Lord, I, I have tried by my own effort, my own will to bring, bring about my dream or even what I think is your dream. But by myself, I can't do it. You put me in spiritual family. You put me in my place. That's a good thing. And you put your spirit in us. Remain in us, I pray. Cause us to remain in you and let your words remain in us. Amen.